Hello, welcome to our online conversation that is part of the exhibition Garden Futures, which opened at the Vitra Design Museum in Weil am Rhein in March 2023, and it will run until October 23, after which it's going on an international tour. And I'm thrilled to be welcoming Julia Watson here today. Julia is a landscape architect and author, academic and activist based in New York City. She runs a landscape architecture studio, but she also teaches, researches, and publishes. For the past 20 years, she's delved very deeply into researching sacred landscapes and nature-based technologies, and she's become a world-renowned expert in that field. For this research, she traveled to often hard to get places in the world to learn more about ancient indigenous technologies. And she argues that the wisdom embodied in these less bears a lot of lessons for the rest of the world, how to work with nature rather than against it. And because the subtitle of our exhibition is Designing with Nature, Julia was of course on top of our list for persons to speak to as part of our own research. But now also as part of our company Ming program. So welcome, Julia. Oh, hi, thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here. Yes, great. So Julia, you studied architecture in your native Australia and landscape architecture at Harvard University in the US where you still live. And as I mentioned before, your work focuses on ancient indigenous technologies and the book you published about these technologies has become an award winning introduction to this topic. Hopefully standard reading for any landscape architecture class. Um, it's called Low Tech Design by Radical Indigenism. So in our research for the exhibition, I started um, talking to a lot of people and one, one argument that I found with, with architects, with ecologists, with philosophers, anyone I, I spoke to or listened to or read was this uh, urgent need to rethink our relationship with nature. Um, and, and I've heard you say that looking at indigenous societies can prove really insightful and inspiring um, when we think about that. Mm. In fact, um, in a conversation we've had before, uh, you mentioned only briefly um, that the concept of sustainability can be traced back to some indigenous thought or you found yeah. um, evidence there as well. I think that's really interesting because we often think of these thoughts that you just explained as or these concepts as perhaps a little bit esoteric, but there's actually the way we think about uh, sustainability today. Um, there's actually a strong link to, to also um, sort of non-Western communities, correct? Yes, yeah, I mean, the, so the term sustainability was first mentioned in the Brooklyn Report in 1987. Um, and it, it's, it goes back to seven generational principle and that, that goes back to the great law of the Iroquois people um, which which means uh, to honor and respect and to to plan um, for the next generation that will come after you in your interactions with um, or how you engage with the way that you live in the world today so that sort of um, becomes like a hundred and maybe 150 years um and so the the things that you plan now will be experienced by probably a fifth generation down the line or um and you can see that in in some of the communities one of the communities that is super interesting and it's on the front of the cover of the book it's uh, the wakasi community who live in north eastern india in a place called cherubunji cherubunji in Meghalaya, and they grow these living bridges that they walk across because their landscape floods um, has the highest rainfall on earth in that particular area. And these bridges are grown from a particular tree. But the person who plants that tree is most likely going to be your great great grandfather. And he'll plant it knowing that he will never experience, you know, get the benefits of that particular tree. And he'll pass down the knowledge of how to care for that to his children through multiple generations. So, probably by the third generation, they're actually able to walk over that living bridge that they've grown. Mm -hmm. There's another technology that's really interesting um, that I sort of previously touched upon, which is in of the Madan people of the southern wetlands of Iraq. They're a community of people who have lived in this particular wetland system for six and a half thousand years. And I think that's 140 generations. 
Um, so this is knowledge captured over 140 of your ancestors passing down knowledge to you. And what they do is they live in this uh, flooded wetland and they create living root islands and houses. And they create this out of something called uh, the Kasabri. And the Kasabri, um, I call it a cultural keystone species. And that's something that I sort of identify as part of the theoretical framework of low tech is there's often a, a cultural keystone species within the um, understanding of a community which really um, has mythology associated with, the, with it, but also really discusses um, a real versatility of materiality or it creates an incredible, um, incredibly interesting material technology for that community. So for the Kassar breed, the Madan people, they give it to their water buffalo for feed, they eat it, they make bread out of it. Um, they then, uh, and, it, and it's like, you know, endemic uh, breed of that particular marshland area. Then they dry it, um, they layer it with mud to make floating island, which they live on. Um, and then they also dry it to make these huge columns that they counterweight to make arches and to then make these really very stylized and very versatile, very adaptable houses um, that are like often an odd number of arches, 13, 15, 17, which they then use that same reed to weave it into the walls and the floors and the roofs. And then they have another bundling, much smaller system to create rafters for the roofs. And so then, just as a final kicker, they don't use any steel. They don't use any metal. They don't have windows. They do now have electricity, but traditionally that they didn't. Um, so these, uh, these houses are made by twisting that reed into a really strong twine that then is used to wrap the construction of these houses together. Um, and they can actually undo or deconstruct these houses and move them in three days and then reconstruct them. So they're incredibly adaptable when we're thinking about sort of adaptability of architecture based on climate events. And um, this, yeah, this community, you know, has lived in this particular location for six and a half thousand years. And they're really um, incredible example of like, how do you deal with floodwaters? And you know, they, they're still having ongoing crises. So they're dealing with other um, types of issues of salination and wastewater now, and they're still innovating to try and um, deal with those types of conditions. And then another, if, if, if I can go to one more example um, that I think is really incredibly relevant is the Berry Wastewater Aquaculture System that we find on the outskirts of the city of Calcutta. Um, city of Calcutta is a city of 14, 15 million people. There is no formal wastewater treatment system that treats the water that's coming out of the center of the city. What actually happens is that water, it goes down the Hooghly River and it is siphoned off into these 350 aquaculture farms of fourth generation aquaculture farmers. And they use that sewerage to feed their fish that then supplies fish to the city, but it cleans the water. So it makes the water clean before it's then re-released back out into the Bay of Bengal and washes out to the ocean. So it's a natural wastewater cleansing system that also feeds the city. And then it has all these incredible other benefits. And it's a really good example because it's something that engages very much with the metabolism of a large scale city. Uh, it, it is a natural infrastructure, informal infrastructure that takes the place of a wastewater treatment system for that city, serving the city, they approximate about $22 million, provides 100,000 jobs for people. They grow a lot of vegetables and rice around this particular system, so they don't need to transport irrigation water um, for the growing of these crops. The transportation, the, what, the, the cost of fuel to transport those particular goods into the city is incredibly reduced because it's not happening out in the countryside, it's happening on the periphery outskirts of that city. So there's incredible benefits, plus it's carbon mitigating and sequestering. Um, it creates incredible habitat 
for lots of different species. And it's just a really incredibly, um, uh, I think, direct potential example of thinking about nature-based infrastructures, working with our um, uh, cities uh, sort of to, to, to not just do one thing, to do you know, a multitude of, of different services for the city where right now we have a wastewater treatment system that you know typically does one single thing for the city. Um, and I think it's it you know it's a fantastic example, and there are other examples very much like that from around the world that are these sort of metabolic wastewater treatment, um, food producing systems as well. One more um, question I have, more specifically also because of garden futures, um, where we started our exploration by looking at gardens as a place in which we negotiate our relationship with nature. And you spoke in one of the conversations we had about the Persian Kanat and the kind of um, possibilities that may, may sort of hold for inspiration for um, landscape architects today. Can you um, tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, so the Kanat is also a system that's um, a very old system and originally it said it was designed for the city of Tehran to transfer water underground in a really arid extreme environment where trans, you know, evapotranspiration is going to reduce the amount of water that you have and it taps your underwater uh, aquifer systems uh, in, a, in a way that's really sustainable because um, it it actually will do it in a way so it won't reduce, completely reduce their, your underground systems. It'll not a well going straight down and pumping straight out. It's actually sort of working horizontally and tapping into the system at a certain point. And so once that water sort of goes below that point of tapping, the aquifer, it'll stop, it'll stop working. But usually it does it in a way through gravity and sort of a, a minimal impact. So they've, they work for a really long time. Um, and so the city of Tehran was built using this Kanat system um, that was sourcing water underground from the mountains nearby. And that technology, you can see the lineage of that technology across the world. In India, there's another system in the book that we look at called the Saranga that actually sort of heralds back to the Kanat system. But it's all across the Middle East. It's in Africa. It's in the Canary Islands. It's in China. And we can see this gradual um probably with trade and, and 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 war and everything else that this migration of this technology this frontier has moved um across the globe and the canat is you know it's basically an underground tunnel that conveys water to cities um or to to places of, of habitation towns and then it's released into the agricultural landscapes that are on the periphery of those cities. Um, and and it, the way that um, it's actually sort of used now as well, or has been in the past, is there's these wells that reach the surface, which allow access to that water that's traveling this underground tunnel. Um, and often there's buildings called Yakta, which are built on top of some of these tunnels. And those buildings, are um, ice makers and so they can make ice in the middle of the desert because they use a combination of having wind tunnels at the top of the building that capture wind and then they have this um, water system underneath and that creates this effect of being able, an incredibly cooling effect so it's a natural ventilation system as well um, and so these sort of really localized temperature control systems go together with this water conveyance system and then at the end as I said um, they're used uh, in gardens and sort of oases and and for agricultural um, uses. So um, what I did think of you know looking at your research that you've done over all these years and you're currently working on a second book it must not always be easy um, not because you're traveling to far-flung places but also because you're engaging in a conversation about perhaps sensitive information about a completely different cultural context perhaps about communities that don't share knowledge in the way that we are used to sharing knowledge um or prefer not for it not to be written down how did you kind of deal with that in your research what was your 
you, your way of addressing that in all these different, um, if there is one way of addressing it, I'm assuming there isn't, but. Um, yeah, no, um, there's, there's not one way of addressing it. Um, although I think there's best practice ways of addressing it that we've also evolved um, how we go about uh, producing and, and interacting with communities. But um, I mean, initially the work came because I was working with the communities. I was working with the Subak and the Badan community. And I just found the technologies in, incredibly interesting and, and worked with experts in the field who were um, engineers, who were Madan and had grown up um, in, in Chabayash, which is one of the, the villages. And they were like, yeah, you know, we'll, we want to get this information out there. We, we need these systems protected. We understand the incredible importance of these systems and um, would sort of work with them to like write up the chapters and interview um, the people, uh, some of the other experts in those communities. But um, I think a lot of the time communities that have really recent atrocities and really far more um, uh, recent decimation, cultural decimation, um, are not willing to share information and, and don't really want to engage with um, myself, like academics who are sort of researching these topics. And that's really fair enough. And that's something that just has to be respected and understood that um, if the system is has you know too much personal or sacred or spiritual or um agenda related um uh, sensitivity then it's just something you're not going to write about and not something you're going to give be given access to and, and you're not going to engage well with that community nor be given any of the trust or um and so there's just you know, we've written some stuff up preliminarily and then tried to work with the community and, and really been told off and told that's not possible. And um, and then we've worked for years to try and engage the community and, and now we're actually on our way to um, writing up some of that work um, after uh, maybe seven, eight years. Um, right. And so there's ways that those sort of relationships can evolve um, uh but you know and sometimes the communities are really deeply um in a landscape that's incredibly remote and they don't have anybody who is um engaging with any form of the internet and no one to speak the language and so you have cultural interpreters that will actually go into those communities in place for you so you're not actually sort of disrupting and sort of being there as a tourist or researcher but there's other people that are already very close to that community who are working with that community and assisting with some of that research and that's really interesting because often um, those interactions uh, we had one the other day with this community in um, Cameroon and the person who's kind of where co-authoring or writing with was like well there are these other incredible systems by these other communities. And then we get really excited because we're like, oh, okay. So this person is like, this person knows so much about all these different infrastructures and they'll just open up because they're really local to that place. They'll open up access or an understanding of like six more, seven more different technologies that I've never seen before. Um, so that's super interesting. Um, but you know, in the first uh, book, I think I was still learning a lot of the ways um, mm -hmm. of how to interact with this sensitive material, how to sort of create allyship, how to not overstep boundaries, you know, what was, what was, what questions you should ask and what information should be available to you um, and how to respect or how to sort of deal with a, um, a rejection of not you know, being accepted to or not mm -hmm. um, being given validation or the validity to actually describe any of this material. Now where in all of the work that we do, we work with Indigenous co-authors and we work very closely with the communities or particular members from the communities that we're writing about and researching and there's continual fact checking um, 
there's um, just a, a, a really constant um, relationship that's built to create um, really accurate and, um, and accepted material to publish out into the world. Okay. Um, you've, you also engage in um, exhibitions or you sort of bring your work out in exhibitions. Um, and for one of them, I believe you've recently sort of created examples of how some indigenous technologies can be applied, um, correct? Yes, um, yes, yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and applied in a different context or adapted to another context. And you've built models around that, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Which maybe I think there were three, but uh, perhaps you yes. can tell us about one of them and the, the sort of original um, related to that or the kind of original inspiration related to that. Yeah, so the exhibition was at the Barbican. It began at the Barbican in the summer. It's called Our Time on Earth. It was curated by Franklin Till, now traveling around the world for the next five years. And it was 18 artists with 12 individual commissions. And, um, and the whole idea was pairing two people together who had not worked together. Um, and I was paired with, as the artist, I was compared with sort of my execution partner, which was um, Smith Mordack from Vera Happold. And she's one of the directors of sustainability and um and she's also a writer uh, and we were asked if we could create if imagine that low tech has become the prevalent way that we design cities in the year 2040 what would that look like and and how do we create so we sort of tried to create this future history scenario of like what would we design and how would we do that and in the end what we actually, and it was kind of a, a, an adaptation from our original idea, we kind of created this playbook on how to work with communities, how to think about creating a hybrid technology for the future for solving a particular problem and what are the best, you know, best practices for working with that community because I think that's actually like a, a really sort of vulnerable and fragile part of the low tech theory is like, well, what are the forms of engagement that are going to be successful and accepted? Um, and, you know, uh, in, in a way, not scary for practitioners to be able to engage with. So well, how would we do this? Um, and we work with three communities, the Subak, the Madan, um, and uh, the Kasi. And um, I think I've mentioned all of them um, already, um, but these meetings online where we had groups of um, people from the community show up and discuss with teams of engineers from Bureau Happold, which were experts in a particular field, like those bridging engineers, um, civil, and then there was hydrological. And, um, and they would have these, we'd have these big sharing workshops of information um, one of the technologies I think was really interesting that came out of that particular um, process was talking to the Kasi in Northeast India about how they create the living bridges, what do those bridges mean, the spirits in the water that speak to them to tell them where to build the bridges, um, how do they relate to their ancestors in that landscape, how do they create, you know, two trees that come together and through it's called um, oscillation, they actually become one tree uh, through like almost like a hinge point. Um, and I previously actually worked with Bureau Hapwood many years ago because I did done some analysis of these trees and they came to the conclusion through these analysis that these trees that are growing with man and nature interacting together holistically, they wouldn't have designed them any different to get um, the highest level of efficiency uh, out of those particular structures. So working together, these incredibly efficient bridging technologies. And the technology that we came up with was actually not a bridge, but uh, a walkway that would grow over a sustainable transportation network through kind of like a scaffolding system that could create a canopy um, that would grow throughout the city uh, that could be applied also in the context of the country of India um, to try and offset urban heat island effect and 
the impact of where you're seeing people, uh, where you're seeing days of over 40 degrees temperatures and to try and create these really different microclimatic conditions that are actually living infrastructures um, that are also inhabitable by many different species um, and beautiful and, and um, you know, sort of giving an alternative to like a, just a sort of a canopy system. Um, and, and in the exhibition, we kind of do these um, projection mappings onto 500, one is to 500 scale models to show the growth of these particular systems um, and how they evolve seasonally and their impacts, like their microclimatic impacts, the, how they change the ambient air temperature and, and a whole other range of impacts to their local environments. This is an interesting point because you've, you, you've said previously that uh, the challenge for you does not really lie in getting uh, getting people or practitioners to understand the importance of these indigenous technologies. The challenge really lies in getting anyone to adapt it or to engage yes. with it or apply it. Um, yes. Why why is that so difficult? Why that challenge? Um, you know, I think it comes from a historical way that designers have engaged with community and indigenous community. Um, initially, um, I think that there's sort of more a um, uh, more a focus on, on cultural engagement and understanding, and it sometimes falls more um, into the realm of, uh, you know, a, a, an artist or a land artist interacting within your project um, and so it's more an acknowledgement of indigenous communities within the frame of how you're designing um, and I think what low tech and, and what uh, this process is actually calling for is an engagement infrastructurally in that understanding and, and, and at that level yes definitely involving those particular processes and understandings but it going much more deeply and saying, well, how did one deal with these particular landscape conditions 200, 300, 400, how many, ever many years ago? What were the infrastructural um, uh, technologies that were perhaps used in these localized environments? And how could we bring that back into the way that we're designing um, any types of the sort of landscape technological um, frameworks in 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 what we're sort of um building and um i think that in that there's just so many um issues of uh allyship versus extraction or, or appropriation there's how do we build the process of workshopping and community engagement and participation uh, into the process of design, where does that happen? How does the client engage with that? Who pays for that? How does it work with a typical timeline of a design project? Um, uh, we we don't really have um, the systems in place, and 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 nor do we. I nor do I think that we have to sort of work with the system that we have and just sort of build small open you know openings or apertures to insert this type of information as quickly as possible um, without adapting the system um, that we currently have and then we also don't have a, a, a recognized way for compensating the intellectual property that comes from these communities and it is used within um, the design of these systems and that's a really important one and to touch on that we did design three technologies in the Barbican project we also designed a fourth technology, which was very different. It wasn't a visual technology. It wasn't a technology that was directly engaging the production of a landscape um, technology. It was a legal innovation and it's called an SOOU, a Smart Oath of Understanding. And it came about, I think, probably from a couple of nightmares that I had during the process of creating this piece where I wake up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night thinking, well, what happens if this technology suddenly gets introduced into a project and becomes incredibly successful and we start seeing it in Indian cities? Like, what's the what, what what's the channel that I opened between the community and between Bureau Hapold 
and did I protect it or did you know did we think about it deeply enough um and and think about the engagement of intellectual property and who how that property is owned by the community and how it's shared because there's a really long history of really bad you know deals happening between indigenous communities in the west and um and especially biotech and medical industry and so we created this it's a nine stanza very very reduced fundamentally framed replacement of an mou um between and for memorandum of under yeah. memorandum of understanding which would often outline the terms and conditions asymmetrically aligned with western law not indigenous law um about the sharing and the compensation related to information usually genetic material um and we sort of tried to outline the very beginnings which would actually sort of uh, um, replace a patenting process, which is the other way that people um, do this right now, which also doesn't really work with the way the indigenous communities share information. The SOU is an orally spoken contract um, that's spoken by, it was spoken by the CEO of Bureau Hapold to each of the community members that we worked with. And then it was responded to um, in indigenous language by the community to say that they accept. Um, it outlined the terms and conditions, it outlined in, in, in very aspirational language um, uh, what this was information was being used for, how it would impact the way that we um, uh, engage with natural conditions and, and progress and outlined some, some of the beginning of the terms of the intellectual property compensation. Um, and it was recorded and it was played in the space where we had these um, technologies set up that people could view. And so it's it's a, an experience, uh, it's an audible experience, which is the way that traditionally Indigenous knowledge is transferred through, through story and, and through oral transmission. I understand. It's interesting because this exhibition allowed you to kind of play out this process of what it would mean to have these yes. technologies and that what 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 came out of it is that not only is the design or the way we think about these sort of physical elements uh, imperative to think about, but it's more the kind of process behind it, right? The legal yeah, the infrastructures, method. the financial yeah. infrastructures and so on. That's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, I mentioned before, um, you're also an activist. We haven't, or we, you know, I feel like some of the work you do is very, um, very much in that kind of space. And one of your most recent projects uh, proves that. Um, it, it just actually, I think when we spoke last, it hadn't been released, you just mentioned it. But I've noticed that in the meantime, um, your, your project has been released, the last one that yes. you worked on. And I think that's really exciting. It's again, something that sort of, um, yeah, takes, takes sort of this idea of low tech out into a completely different space. So tell yes. us um, yeah. about that a little bit. Yeah, we actually have dropped three of the low tech curriculum happening uh, live now. Um, and what it is, is, um, you know, I had been teaching for 12 years and, and really, um, I think I had maybe four students who came from um, uh, Indigenous or uh, Latinx or um, um, Black marginalized urban communities at the schools that I was teaching. And, and I found that really problematic that um, there wasn't an engagement with youth in their cities that could make uh, the, the changes or, or the knowledge to be able to make the changes that we're talking about later on. And I was like, well, one of the biggest impacts that I think we could have is to try and teach low tech at high school and to create a low tech curriculum that could be taught from grade nine to 12 which would be really aligned with the way the educational system is trying to um, to go, and 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 that some of the topics that um, it's trying to navigate, being decolonization, uh, interdisciplinary work, research based, phenomena based, um, project work, um, it, and 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 also uh, curriculum that deals with sustainability and climate change, like really incredibly relevant topics to to the youth of today. And so in the last now been eight months, I think, 
Um, I've been working with a um, woman who's been a high school teacher and educator and land-based activist, Melissa Gurney, um, who's from New York. Um, and we've been working on creating a curriculum, an online curriculum for high school for grades nine to 12, so that we can really sort of start earlier and start changing minds sooner and give a vocabulary and the tools and the, and the understandings and, and the projects and the inspiration to high school kids rather than big kids like us uh, way, way before um, they're sort of in, in the workplace. And to, to, to really think, well, we talk about system, the solution of systemic problems with low tech, but what about the problem of the education system? And how do we really think about systemic change in that framework? And so it's really exciting because during this process, I actually found out that low tech is being already taught uh, in grade 12 as part of the curriculum, the um, advanced placement curriculum, preparing kids for college in the US or, or, or nationally. And so it sort of, sort of um, was synchronous and really great inspiration that it's already happening, but we're now expanding that whole concept from low tech theory and teaching it from setting up a, co uh, a curriculum from grades nine till 12. Perfect. And um, how do how do I get to have a look at it? Is there a way to? to find yes. It? <laughs> yes. Um, there's a website, www.lotech.com, which previously didn't exist. It shows the book, it shows the curriculum. Uh, you can order the curriculum. It's still in its um it's a uh, it's sort of pre-order phase it'll be finally released in august just ahead of the school year um but we're slowly doing releases throughout the summer perfect and this was a self-initiated project right it wasn't associated it was, with any um with any entity or no no it was literally an email from um this uh teacher melissa uh who just cold emailed me and said have you thought about doing something like this and i was like and I kind of had, I have a, a bunch of other ideas about sort of educational platforms. And I sort of saw this as a bit of a first step um, into the exploration of how to build a project like this. And I said, sure, you know, let's, let's have a chat. And then it just turned into this um, bigger project that's now sort of six months, eight months in, in the workings. And, um, and now with the second book, obviously there's going to be, you know, a much a, a much bigger engagement so we can keep on building on this information as well perfect that sounds like such a perfect project i'm really looking forward to reading it and it's also the one we'll end on now so thank you so much for being here to talk thank you very much and um yeah i hopefully speak soon and we'll be checking out the curriculum yeah, thank you so much and all the best with the exhibition and the book is exceptionally beautiful. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.